Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your word, and by that word we see our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Help us uh, to keep our eyes focused upon Christ and amidst the many distractions of today's world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. There she is. Yeah. Okay. So we are in that third book, the book of uh, Joseph, which is uh, pretty much most of the book of Genesis. And uh, we're actually in the, we're going to be starting chapter 38. And I will admit, for me, this is uh, one of the, the toughest chapters to wrestle with. Okay. Um. It's, uh, it, it has a lot of stuff to it, I should just say. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have a lot of good theology. Well, it does, but uh, it's a little stretched. Uh, but uh, we'll still have a little fun with it anyhow. Uh, and then, uh, so we're taking a little sidestep. We started with Joseph and his brothers and <laughs> sold Joseph into slavery. And just as we sold Joseph into slavery, we're going to go to Judah. Okay, keep one thing in mind. And Judah is in the line of Christ, mm -hmm. not Joseph. So is Tamar. <laughs> I usually say Tamar, but yeah. Okay, so now let's get to Judah and Tamar, or Tamar, however you want to pronounce that. Mm -hmm. um, from Genesis chapter 38, 1 through 5. It happened that at that time, Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite, whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite, whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Uh, G Judah was in Chazeb uh, when she bore him. So basic, yeah. Judah kind of gets married, okay, um, and has three sons. Plain, simple, to the point. Okay, let's uh, move on. Verse 6, and Judah took a wife for her, his uh, firstborn, and her name was, uh, I don't know how you want to pronounce that, I usually say Tamar. That's okay. good. Huh? Okay, uh, but Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. And you're like, Lord, why don't you do that today? <laughs> yes. What's all the There's nobody, left. There's nobody <laughs> left. Okay. Uh, hmm. So we have a, a, a an exception here. And we're not given the reason for the exception. Except God said, eh, you're done. We got many wicked people, okay? I mean, if you think about Sodom and Gomorrah, if you think about the great flood, okay? But now we're getting down to a singular. You, you're in the way. Next. And you're like, whoa, can God do that? Oh, yeah, he can do that, okay? So all of a sudden, it's just like, boom, this happens. We don't know exactly how they knew. I guess Moses knew, okay. But it's just like, okay, you're wicked. You're done for. Okay. Now we're going to get into some interesting things. Verse 8. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. And this is in relation to Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as her wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. Is that mandatory? 
Is that mandatory? Thank you for asking that question. Give me two more slides and I will give you the answer. God will give you the answer to that question. Okay. It's all leading to something. It is leading to something here. Strangely enough, I don't know how many of you have ever heard of this Leverite marriage system. So, you know, you have three brothers. And if one of them dies, not leaving any children, the second one is supposed to take that wife and produce a child for that deceased brother. Right, not their own. Not their own. So, we're, we're not going to get to Onad yet. Uh, that's the idea. But let's bring this into the New Testament, because Jesus gets asked this question. Mm -hmm. From Matthew chapter 22, verse 23. Uh, sorry for the wow. small print here. Yeah. Let me just read it. The same day the Sadducees came to him, referring to Jesus, uh, and the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection, and they asked Jesus a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said, If a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. That's the Leverite marriage system. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died, and having no offspring, left his wife to his brother. So to the second and the third, down to the seventh, all of them, uh, after them all, the woman died, sorry. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered them, you are wrong because you ne ne know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they will neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. As for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. Okay. So this question of the Leverite marriage system also comes up in the time of Jesus. And Jesus does not dismiss it. He's going after the bigger uh, issue is that the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead, okay? And that is the bigger issue. And so we need to keep the proper things in the proper place here. So the resurrection of the dead, that is key, okay? Uh, the Levite marriage system is just a, a way of, you could say, uh, keeping a little bit of order while you're here on earth because sometimes bad things uh, happen. Uh, you have the death of Ur, even though he was a wicked person and God caused that death. Um, but now we had a system in place where Onad would be told uh, you need to take uh, your brother's wife and raise up a child for your brother, not for you. Okay, very important about that concept. Why do I say it's important? because it's gonna get broken, but that's a different story. Um, uh, let's go on to what Onan does, because here's another mishap with this verse. <laughs> hmm, verse nine. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, okay? So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground, so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. You know, these two verses actually come across in a, a little bit of a theological um, <clears throat> quandary of sorts. So let me ask this question, just to make sure we're all on the same page. What, yeah. <laughs> why was Onan put to death? He wasted his semen, he didn't. Didn't produce enough, right? <laughs> That's you know what you're supposed to do. Hmm. All of the above. <laughs> All the above. That's always the best answer. So he did not do what the Lord expected him to do, right? Which was to produce an offspring. That's what it was all about. Was okay. it just an offspring, or was it a son? <clears throat> a, a son. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because the line would be perpetuated through right. the male line. Right. Okay. Okay, so now let's go back to um, John's question here earlier. Was this a requirement? Yeah. Well, if you take a look at the requirement of producing a male heir uh, and God zaps him for not doing so. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. 
you can kind of get the idea this is a requirement. Yeah. Now, this verse has also been used a little interesting, where they'll put the emphasis not on Onad refusing to mm. produce a male heir for Ur, but for spilling his semen on the ground. He was being mm. deceitful. Huh? He was being deceitful. Well, now I'm going to go to the spilling of semen <laughs> because, <laughs> hold on a second, uh, you, I already heard one person mention birth control. Okay. That, and sometimes people have morphed this passage to say no to birth control and also have used this passage against uh, the idea of masturbation. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there going, wait a minute, what's the purpose of this verse? Why did God zap, lack of a better term, own it? Disobedience. An error. Disobedience. Disobedience. Okay. But now disobedience for what? So, so you, you had... Offspring to his brother. They needed an error. You, you have a lot of different thoughts out there, and this is why we call it adult Bible class. <laughs> okay, and you're sitting there going, okay, wow, really? People are all over the page on this. And I want you to think about one thing. Um, uh, and it was mentioned a little bit earlier on, and I tried to bypass it really quickly because we'll eventually get to it. Tamar is in the line of Christ. We are talking about uh, ultimately, the male heir, yes. okay? The savior of the world. So I'm going to use that as my connecting point that sit there and say to those churches that want to set up a, a particular agenda, don't use this proof passage, please, okay? I, I don't think these passages are actually a good proof passage for that agenda. Um so that's my only little takeaway on that one. Okay, so now we have Judah had three sons, and he's down to one living. Mm-hmm. And he's a bit younger. What do you do? You have Tamar, who is 0 for 2. And, but now here's the question. Did the sons die because of Tamar, or did they die because of their own wickedness? They died because of their own wickedness. So now let's take a look at the next verse. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah, my son, grows up. For he feared that he would die like his brother's. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. Okay, we just got through saying the brothers died because they were evil. Okay, Judah dismisses that. Does Judah know that? He doesn't know that. Parents, do we not know if our children are evil? Okay, my mom's not here to sit there and say my child is not evil, okay? (laughs) Um, But, you know, okay, so sometimes we get that parent denial. Okay, uh, but also sometimes parents sit there and go, oh yeah, I know what my child does. <laughs> my apologies, okay? Um, already got that uh, for confirmation, uh, and so I'm still getting that up in a couple weeks. I already had one of the parents ahead of time just forewarn me, my child likes to talk. I'm like, awesome, <laughs> don't apologize. I'm like, uh, okay, no, 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 this is gonna be great. This is gonna be awesome, but okay. Another thing I want you to keep in mind, because I know how this is gonna go, uh, notice the command of Judah. Remain a widow. Mm-hmm. You're going to refrain until my youngest son grows up. Okay. That's the command. Put that in the back of your mind. Next slide. When Verse 13. When Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah, to shear his sheep. She took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up and sat at the entrance to Enam, Enam, um, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah, 
was grown up and she had not been given to him in marriage. Jealousy. Ah. What's going on here? What happens when you take off the widow clothes and you put on a veil over your face? Salome so so was dancing. So yeah, you're now you're going, you're becoming a a prostitute of sort. You're sort of veiling your face. You're becoming hidden. Uh, there was a certain time and a place for that. Uh, but if you're sitting there by yourself with just a veil on your face like that, um, it somewhat had uh, different intentions. Okay, but so notice something else though. The justification for it was that Sheila was grown up and she had not been given to him in right. marriage. How long was she waiting? Right. A few yeah. years. Yeah. Now, keep in mind, I want to entertain this discussion at this point. Tamar was first married to Ur, <clears throat> Judah's firstborn. Who would inherit everything? Ur. Would have Ur. But when he died, it would have gone to Ur Onad. Okay, and she would still have to raise up children for her who would do the inheriting. That's part of the Leverite marriage system. And she'd wind up with nothing. Ah, now she winds up with nothing. That's the point I want to get to. Is now, now that Sheila was not given to her, she's like, wait a minute, I'm really supposed to be the wife of the person inheriting Judah's estate. Mm-hmm. Okay, I married a sugar daddy here, <laughs> lack of a better term. Okay, and it's now been taken away from her. Mm. She has a plan. Verse 15. Yes. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, yeah. for she had covered her face. So, again, I'm going to bring back something I, I asked you to remember earlier. Judah said to Tamar, remain a widow. So you had that command. Remain a widow until my son grows up. <clears throat> but son grew up yeah. and was not given. Okay. But the command, you remain a widow. Okay. Um, Pastor. Yes. Does, does that imply then that she would have had the legal Levite right to remarry? And he's only asking her as kind of a favor not to remarry? Uh, okay, so going back to this. Um, Good question. She is actually, the Levite marriage system does not give her entitlement to remarry, per se. Okay? And it depends on your point of view of what you mean by marriage. Okay? There are two aspects of marriage. But let's use it for the transfer of property for right now. The transfer of property was going to be from Judah to Ur, the firstborn. And so she was supposed to produce a child for Ur, uh, who uh, was supposed to inherit the property. Not necessarily to be the perpetual wife for Onad or Sheila. Okay? So once you got the male heir, uh, male heir sorry, uh, we're done. Okay, now that brother can then go and marry his own wife and have children for his own. Okay, so in theory, she does not marry again for extra property per se. Uh, she is only married once. Uh, that's for the property transfer. Uh, as far as sexual intercourse, yes, until she has a male, male heir. Okay, then... Um, uh, once the male error happens, uh, then she again uh, remains back into widowhood. That's the way that system is designed. Okay, so that, did you understand how I answered your question? Okay, I confused you. So your, your, your question was, does she marry again? Well, did she have the right, when Judah asked her to remain a widow, did she have the right to say, you know, Thanks for the offer, but I'm just going to go back to my father's house no. and marry my old grammar no. school boyfriend. Be okay, let me let me explain it this way. Uh, Tamar is the property of Judah. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's right. We forgot about that. Okay. Okay. And that answers it then. 
And so basically he's saying to her, you know, just go back and live with your father, but you still kind of belong to me. Remember, I'm supposed to give you to my third son, but I didn't. Um, but he's still calling the shots. She is in one essence her property because he acquired her for her. Okay. okay, so again, you got to think of this on the property uh, aspects yeah. because too often um, in our American mindset, uh, we um, we muddle up uh, the definition of marriage and we start talking about love. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. In the Old Testament, we we don't care about love. Uh, we care about property. Okay, sorry, I hate to be sarcastic, but uh, it's just we operate with a little bit of a different definition. Uh, they're operating with uh, property. Who owns Tamar? I hate to say it that way. Uh, Judah does. OK, that answers, yeah. uh -huh. so, um, you know, bottom line is she did not have the right to rem uh, to remarry uh, ever, regardless if the leave right marriage system took place or not, because once she has a child who is supposed to be the child of heir, er, OK, uh, again, she's not going to be engaging in anyone else. So she is going to be a widow. OK, um, and not marrying a husband unless something really, really strange or if Judith sort of says makes an exception. OK, so but I want to bring up another interesting thing here. So we have the command of Judah remain a widow. OK. Oh, what's Judah doing? I'm looking for a prostitute. Whoa! What's good for the goose is not yeah. good for the gander, or how does that phrase go? Yeah, uh-huh. That, that was Tamar. Hmm? He, thought, he did not know that it was Tamar. He, he thought it was just a regular prostitute. Hey, is, is he remaining faithful? Oh, no. Men, that's the point I'm trying to make here. Okay. Above the law, I so, <laughs> so that's the point I'm trying to make. He's <laughs> he's on the run. He's just like, okay, hey, guess what I found along the way? And she's told, uh, you better remain chaste. Mm -hmm. That's the message. Okay. And so, okay, so let's uh, sit there and go, okay, um, Welcome to equality, right? Yeah. Remember, um, ever since the fall, this is not a perfect world. Okay? Not trying to excuse it. Uh, I'm actually just going to try to say, uh, fortunately for us, we have a Savior who loves sinners. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. That was just a custom then, though. Huh? That was just the custom at that time. It was very much the custom, but I'm also showing the um, the difference in our culture and our way of handling that. Okay, um, but uh, let's let's just uh, move on here. Uh, I've beaten up on Judah a little bit too much, but that's okay. Uh, verse sixteen. He turned to her at the roadside and said, L "Come, let me come into you." For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you give me that you may come into me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, if you give me a pledge uh, until you send it. Uh, he said, uh, what pledge shall I give you? She replied, your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her and she conceived by him. Hmm. Okay, I'm going to bring Luther in here. Uh, if, if you notice, I hadn't brought in a lot of Luther yet right. in this section. Mm -hmm. um, Luther and I have a little disagreement on some things, a little academic yeah. disagreement here, but now I'm going to bring in Luther here. Um, and that's okay. I don't have to agree with Luther on everything, but he does point me to Christ, which is always good. But uh, this time, uh, I'm going to bring in Luther. On the basis of this narrative, it seems that the suspicion of lust and fornication can be put on Judah as though previously, too, he had been guilty of this vice. For how could it happen that Tamar took confidence in her heart that he could be deceived by the semblance of harlotry? If she had not known that he was accustomed to indulge in acts of promiscuous lust, and why did Judah not proceed directly to his flocks? With his mind set on one business of shearing his flocks, but disregarding this is suddenly inflamed with lust at the sight of a harlot. What gives him this idea so suddenly? 
I, I just like how Luther sort of puts it here. Uh, he then actually kind of backpedals off of this, and again, so I don't put those words in, uh, but I, I love this part here because you could almost, it's dripping with sarcasm here. And it, was, it begs this question, why was it so easy for this plan to come across? You have one of two choices. Either A, God planned it this way, or B, Tamar realized, uh, yeah, he likes to <clears throat> visit some other gals along the way. Here's my opportunity, okay? Uh, and it's going to work because I know who he is. I'll let your sinful human nature come up with your own conclusion to that. <laughs> if you want to put the best construction on it, and it's a good construction, uh, God's in charge. And I don't mind that uh, conclusion. I kind of like that conclusion. God is in charge. He's going to cause it to happen. Uh, but if your sinful nature is a little bit more tainted, um, uh, you might sit there going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Especially that she was commanded to remain a widow, and he's out looking. Okay, let's go on to verse 19. Then she arose and went away, and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. Now, I want to bring Luther in for this um, another moment here, okay? Because right now, Luther and I are really kind of a gelling here. Uh, from this, it is clear that Tamar was an upright and honorable woman, for she is not proud nor does she prostitute herself to others. She seeks no illicit pleasures. She makes it uh, her one aim to be able to become a mother in this house to which she had been placed by divine authority. Therefore, she lays aside the garment she had put on, clothes herself again with the garments of widowhood, and sits in mourning. Although she had been made pregnant, she awaits a further blessing from the Lord. So Luther brings up the idea, she was not proud, but she was humble. Okay, she will return back to being a widow. That's what she was told to do. And that's what she was going to continue to do. Even though Judah kind of reneged on his promise, she took care of that, and now we will let the Lord take care of it. What if she just stand there and did nothing? What would happen then? It would ruin the whole story. <laughs> ah, you're right. That would have ruined the whole story, and she would have taken herself out of the line of Christ, and the Lord would have provided uh, something else. Yeah, not Okay. <laughs> Just because... Christ is going to come into this world, Craig, whether or not Tamar That's is right. going to do Just this. Just control. Okay. God's plan of salvation will be completed. Yeah. Trust me. That's, that's why I said just because it doesn't run the whole story. It just changes the story. Yeah, it possibly changes it, Jim. I, I, don't, I don't know if you're still going to get to it. Did, did Luther address the issue as to why Judah did not give Sheila to her when he became of age? Uh, yeah, the scriptures bring that, brought that up is because he was afraid he was going to die also. She had a bad track record going against him 0 for 2 and was figuring she was going to strike out. Luther agree with that? Um, well, that's what scripture says, so I actually don't, didn't really track that very well. So I'm hoping Luther doesn't agree, disagree with scripture. <laughs> I'm going to go with scripture above Luther all the time. So uh, once I got to that point, I figured, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go down, uh, what, I got to read pages and pages of Luther. Sorry. <laughs> okay. He's not quick bullet points. He's like, you know, for one bullet point, he elaborates for 10 pages. It's just like, okay, Luther, yeah, I got to the point. Okay, can we move on here? But okay. yeah. But anyway, so uh, let's uh, continue the narrative here. Verse 20. Then Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adulamite, to take back the pledge from the woman's hand. He did not find her. And he asked the men of the place, where is the cult prostitute who was at uh, Ed Edame? Uh, at the roadside, and they said, no cult prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. And the men of the place said, no cult prostitute has been here. There, there's a couple of interesting things about this little mm -hmm. section of scripture here. So you now have, let's say, Judah saying, hey, I did my part. She wanted a goat. I sent the goat, couldn't find her. My hands are clean. But then you also have the concept, well, what about the pledge? Hmm, it'd be nice to have that stuff back, but oh well. 
Uh, we're going to find out more about that. Mm -hmm. But I want to just, I want to, okay, I'll take a couple questions and then I'm going to, I have a very interesting Hebrewism to point out, which is going to blow your mind here. Okay, so Janet, we'll start with you first. Did it make a difference if they were a cult prostitute or just a normal prostitute? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for bringing that question. I'm going to put it on hold because that's the actual Hebrewism I want to get to. Oh, okay. I want to quick grab John's it's question. About the same thing. Isn't it? About the same that's thing? A, that's an organization. Okay. I figure that's... Ooh, ooh, is it an organization? Let's, so let's talk about the word cult. Yes. What's the Hebrew for cult? Ah, you ready for this? It's, it's, for those of you who went to the early service, you sang it in the Sanctus called Holy. What? Yeah. It's the word we use for holy. Oh, it got translated here by the ESV as cult. But so let me read this to you in the Hebrew. No holy prostitute has been here. And you're like, how, how, how do you come up with the word holy? Why was that word used? Yeah. Judah does not use that word. The Adulamite uh, uses that word. Okay, so what's going on here? So does holy... So, so this is where translators have to hmm, do a little bit of fudging, a little bit, especially with Hebrew because words can seem to have other meanings. And so they're t picking up on this word holy as a way of referring to like the temple. Yeah. Like, uh, and so it gets translated as cult, okay? Uh, a different religion, but there's only one religion, okay? So there's worship of the almighty God and then there's a bunch of cults for a lack of a better term, okay? So it gets translated as cult prostitute. Um, uh, and, but it's interesting that the Odulamite is the one who actually brings in the theological term here, not Judah, okay? So, again, I, I don't want to make a big deal about it. It's just one of those stumbling blocks in Hebrew. You sort of sit there and go, okay, where did this come from? Um, but that's okay. Uh, I'm just going to name it and then try to run from it as fast as I possibly can. <laughs> so bottom line is during that time, you had the various, uh, quote unquote, other religions. Okay. And they would have various temples and uh, prostitutes being part of the temple was kind of the norm. And by the way, gals, just to let you know, they also had guy prostitutes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So it wasn't just female prostitutes. Okay. Yes. Yes, um and I'm, I'm sure it attracted a crowd. I'll just put it that way. Um, but anyway, it is not God-pleasing. This is not the what the Almighty God has ever set up. This is what uh, humanity has set up. So it was not uncommon to have uh, various prostitutes hanging around, uh, being part of the temple, and so forth down the line. And if you remember your Old Testament history, um, the sons of Eli, the priest, mm -hmm. okay, got themselves into trouble. Why? And they were kind of wanting to sit there and reinvent, or I shouldn't say reinvent, but institutionalize uh, what the other cults were doing, other uh, religions, and bring it into the Lord's temple. Mm -hmm. So yes, uh, they were having inappropriate relations with women who were coming for sacrifice. And they're like, hmm. So, yeah, it sort of even, even made its way into God's temple, but it was displeasing to God. Yes, they were killed, and uh, up comes uh, Samuel, a uh, new way of doing things. But anyway, that's a, a different book of the Bible. Yes? just want to add that, that women at that culture did not have many choices in life. And um, sometimes people think prostitute, and they think that women just decided to be evil, decided to be bad. Some of these women were just forced into that type of behavior and lifestyle. Not necessarily because they wanted to, but they didn't have a choice. Luther actually brings that up, and he names it this way in regards to Tamar, is that Tamar could have been used prostitution as a way of making a living for herself so she would not be as poor as she was as a widow. And then, I didn't want to bring it in just because it would have uh, made the story longer, but since you, you introduced it, so let me just continue that line of thought. Remember, she was heir to Judah's fortune. Yeah. Her husband was supposed to inherit it all. Her sons would have been inheriting it all. 
and now she's living impoverished as a widow? Well, she's living in her father's house, but we don't really know if it's impoverished or whatever. Right. You're right. She has no inheritance. She has and no means of making a money right. either. Okay? And so forth. So could her father still take care of her? We don't know. But uh, Luther brings up the point she could have been very, very impoverished, and she went back to that instead of just becoming a prostitute. Okay, just this one time for Judah and Judah only, but now let's find out um, what's going to happen. Verse 23. Uh, so Judah's looking for those things, the pledge back, and Judah replied, let her keep the things as her own, or shall we be laughed at? You see, I sent this young goat, and you did not find her. Okay, so he's basically saying, eh, don't worry about it. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. Remember, this is the same guy who just visited a cult prostitute. Right. In those days, they now that means something else. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so anyway. So notice the, um, <clears throat> the differences in approach. So Judah has already judged her. Bring her out and let her be burned. Sounds like David and Samuel. Ooh. Serious yeah, talk, yeah, judgment. Uh, no asking no questions. None of that. Keep that judgment in mind. We're probably not going to get it today, but next week we're going to get back to Joseph. And Joseph is going to run into a little bit of a hiccup at his first duty station, so to speak. And if Potiphar would have asked some questions, it would have gone well for him. He didn't ask questions. Judah wasn't asking questions either. Condemn. No trial. You're guilty. Next. Okay. Verse 25. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law. By the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. And notice it's the please identify. I'm bringing back from Genesis chapter 37, verse 32. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, we have found this. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. Remember, the chief comes to their own conclusions. You don't interpret for the chief. Okay, so... Um, for uh, Jacob, it was his job to identify his son's robe. For Judah, it was his job now to identify the person who impregnated Tamar. Ah, now we're going to get to something, again, very, very interesting. Now we're going to get to true test of character. What happens when you make a mistake. Everyone makes a mistake. Everyone's a sinner. Are you willing to fess up to it? Verse 26. Then Judah, Judah identified them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son, Shelah, and he did not know her again. Okay, going from the death penalty to back to heir of Judah's estate. What does he mean by again? Once was enough on the roadside when she was dressed up as a prostitute. Yes. Oh, oh, I thought he was talking about his son, she was in that. No, 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 no. Judah, so yeah, Judah, yeah, we're talking about Judah, okay? He's basically saying, since I didn't give her to my son, and just the Bible is now clarifying, uh, he didn't grab her as a wife. Remember Jim's question that I uh, was trying to answer there. Did she have a right to remarry? No. Okay. She truly belonged to her. Okay. And now we're going to find out some more inconsistencies about this. That's why I'm making a big deal about this. Okay. So he did not have sex with her again. Bottom line to that. 
Okay, uh, but now she again goes from being burned at the stake to uh, my sons will inherit Judah's fortune. Well, who was she if, if her died? I'm sorry, what? Who was she? What responsibility did she have after her died? Ah, let me start going into my slides here I think because. I'm going to show a little bit of an inconsistency. And the first slide I'm going to show has some errors to it. So bear with me on the errors here. Okay, so this is kind of a little bit of a family line here. You got Judah, you have Shua, uh, producing air. And actually there should be two other lines coming down here. Uh, Onad, who they put down here as the son of air, and that's, yeah. that's an error, okay? And uh, Sheila should also be next, who's not even on here, but that's okay. What I like about this is it names that Shua is a Canaanite, Tamar is a Canaanite, you have Ruth who's a Moabite, you have Rahab who's a Canaanite, and you have Bathsheba, and all the way at the bottom of you have Yeshua referring to Jesus. Notice the uh, lack of pure blood here, mm -hmm. okay? Because the Pharisees were very all about pure blood, okay? Uh, but guess what? Your Messiah is not pure blood, okay? Um, I disagree with this. Uh, the author of this, again, I said Ur's, or Onad is in the wrong place. Uh, <clears throat> I disagree with the red highlighting of these four gals. Um, I don't think it had a good intention, but that's okay. Uh, but then there's a little dotted line here for Leverite. Okay, and that's what that says here. So Onad produced, uh, had a Leverite marriage, but really did not produce any offspring. The offspring of uh, Zerah and Perez are from Judah. Okay. Um, notice one thing. Um, who's first here? Zara, uh, Zara mm -hmm. and, and Perez, huh? Mm -hmm. Right. There's going to be a debate about that one yeah, also, but we start. haven't gotten to it. Now let me bring another one of these lines into it. Again, we're having a hard time graphing this. Yeah. That's because... Right. Do you have nightmares at night with all these people? <laughs> <laughs> Just pronouncing them. Okay, all right, good. <laughs> okay, so we have these two little strange symbols here which typically mean like a marriage relationship, but Tamar did not enter a marriage relationship with Judah. Tamar is in a marriage relationship with Ur, okay? And in theory, here's my disagreement here. They have the children of, now we have Perez being named first, and Zara named second. We're gonna unpack that in a second. They really should be connected to the marriage relationship of Tamar and Ur because Judah performed the Levite marriage system, and in doing so, the children do not belong to Judah, but to Ur. But guess what? In all your biblical narratives of Jesus, Ur is not mentioned. Right. That's an error. Oh. That's an error. Thank you for picking up on that. Yes. But Ur is the son of Judah. Yes but not in the line of Jesus. But there's a blood well, relationship. Wait, 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 wait. If Judah, if Er is the son of Judah, then yes, Judah is in the line of Jesus. Judah is, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Judah also fathered Perez and Zerah, yeah. but in the Levite marriage system, so there were these two children <laughs> right. should really be children of Er, right. not children of Judah, but grandchildren. However, Scripture doesn't grab it that way. And so you're just sitting there going, well, you made this big deal about this Levite marriage system. Okay. Yeah. And now you have the lineage of Christ and error is just dropped off the map. And so you're sitting there going, why? And then I'm going to go back to what I said about Jesus, what about the resurrection of the dead. That's the more important thing. Let's not get too hung up about the Levite marriage system. Okay, Wayne. Yeah, but Judah is not a brother. I'm sorry, Judah is what? Judah is not a brother. Judah is not whose brother? Well, he's not a brother of the sons. Correct. Those are his sons. Correct. Okay, so he's, he's not part of that system. 
He's the father. He's not the son. He's the father of these three. He's not the brother of the, of the son. Correct. And he's the biological father to these two. Now he but can't be part of the Levite family. He's the father. He fulfilled that role, though. Well, so now we got to change the word Leverite back to father. Well, no, I mean, this maybe is... Maybe that's why they leave that up. Right, that could be the reason why, is because he wasn't part of the brotherhood line for that Leverite system. And so um, bottom line is you got lots of exceptions. So what the conclusion I want you to, to understand is this. As Christians, we're not going to practice the Leverite marriage system okay let's just leave it alone thank you <laughs> okay leave it alone it just gets way too messy so if you have uh tons of boys and you're not having lots of uh, uh grandchildren uh no we're not going to be swapping wives doesn't okay. uh, scripture say that jesus is in the line of melchizedek the high priest yeah uh, yeah. part of the order uh, not the yeah. line of the oh. order of melchizedek so i'll, I'll that's sort of different. Uh, that's begotten that that means he's not part of the the Levite uh, order, and the and the and the sons of Aaron. Okay, and we'll we we can if I get through Genesis, if I get through Genesis, and move on to Exodus, we can talk more about that in Exodus. Okay, but let me uh, bring uh, Luther here for a moment. Okay. But these matters are set forth for our consolation. Great saints must make great mistakes in order that God may testify that he wants all men to be humiliated and contained in the catalog of sinners. And that when they have acknowledged and confessed this, they may find grace and mercy. If one fails, how is he to get help? That's Nevertheless, true. those who crucify Christ here this prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. To be sure, one must be aware of sins. But if anyone has fallen, he should not become despondent on that account. For God has forbidden both despair and presumption, turning aside to the left hand and to the right. Okay, so Luther comes up with this beautiful gem at this kind of point. Oh, and in sort of summarizing uh, Tamar and Judah at this point, I love the phrase, great saints must make great mistakes. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> okay, because typically we think the opposite. That, you know, those that don't make any mistakes, they must be great. Okay, well, okay. Fair enough. Uh, Luther is not trying to say, go ahead and make more mistakes to prove how great you are. No, uh, but he's noting that we make mistakes, we are sinners, and this is by God's design to, for us to be humiliated so that we confess, Lord, have mercy, we, I, a poor, miserable sinner. Okay, that's what Luther is trying to put the focus on because when we realize we need a Savior, here's our Savior, and Christ says, Father, forgive them. The second point is, comes at the end, uh, we need to be aware of our sins. Yep. Amen. And if anyone has fallen, we all have, we shouldn't be despondent. That is not a lot. That basically Luther is trying to say, don't allow the this burden of the sin to weigh you down. Okay. You are forgiven. Because sometimes we have those skeletons in the closet. And sometimes particular sins are just so overwhelming. We just can't function at all. And that's where the forgiveness of sins comes in, to take away those sins, to lift us up so that we can continue on. Uh, so we should not become despondent on, the count, on uh, this account because God has forbidden both the despair and for us to be arrogant about it. Okay, to just sort of paraphrase Luther here. So God doesn't want you to despair because of your sin, and God doesn't want you to be the, go, being arrogant, going, I can go do whatever I want. What's in the middle? That's what God wants you to be. Any, yes, John. Um, being a Catholic for many years, um, you're talking about big sins and small sins here. And okay. What, I'm talking forgiven, about all sin, I, but go ahead. I, yeah. Am I forgiven because I made this little sin? You are forgiven because of Christ. Amen. Big or small, you're forgiven, John. Well, that's really what they're talking about here. Uh, 
And so what L- Luther is trying to say, you are forgiven. Don't let these sins really weigh you down. Rejoice in the forgiveness that comes from Christ. Wayne? Uh, therefore, uh, the phrase zero tolerance yep. is something from the secular world. Correct. And should it be adopted by the church? David should it was a great sinner. He was not removed from office. He, as an individual, was forgiven, and his office continued. Saul, Saul uh, disobeyed. Uh-huh. He was not removed from office immediately, of course. Eventually, he died with his son yep. and made room for the dynasty of David. Yep. But see, that's why I have problems with that zero tolerance. You're not the that's only a, one. That's, Wait, a, that's a worldly viewpoint. It is a worldly viewpoint. You're right. Um uh, unfortunately, and I'll give you the argument that they would use for that, is the church exists right now in the world, okay? But you're right, it is a worldly viewpoint. We should be practicing forgiveness. However, what do you do, especially when people are kind of repeatedly well, doing this? Yes, and, yes. and that almost goes back to Judah here, Same okay? Thing. And is not Judah forgiven? Yes. He is, but now would you allow that for your pastor? Be careful how you answer. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. I'm and only joking. Okay. Sometimes, sometimes the greatest sinners that have repented and changed course are the best evangelists for Christ. You're right. You're right. Be- because they have understood the forgiveness of sins and they really felt the burden of the forgiveness of sins. And I'll give you a good way that that works um, where I was trying to do, see if I could do some ministry of helping out uh, people who are struggling with addictions. And I was talking to a lead chaplain somewhere and he said, what addiction are you struggling with? And I'm sitting there going, well, I really don't have any addictions. And he's looked at me and said, "Uh, I can't use you. And I'm like, huh? You're addicted to Christ. That's I'm I'm addicted to sin. And the Old Testament. Yes. That, that's, <laughs> addicted to sin is uh, what I should have said at that point. I wasn't fast enough at that point and didn't understand it, but um, I allowed him to uh, dismiss me at that point. Uh, but it was basically the mindset that if you hadn't committed uh, this type of uh, sin and you're struggling with it, you really can't minister to other people. And again, I'm like, wait a minute, my job is to bring forgiveness of sins, okay, that comes from Christ. Uh, not for me to quote unquote, you know, sympathize. Let me bring healing of the gospel. Okay. Not saying that I have to do that. So do I have to have an affair so I can minister to people in my congregation who have had affairs? The answer is no. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, our world is struggles with this on both ends. So you got the zero tolerance, you got the whole addiction model that says you got to understand addictions and I'm sitting there going, Lord have mercy, Satan is working in many different ways to try to shut the gospel down and we should always be tried to be bold to continue to proclaim Christ. So um, I understand why we have a zero tolerance policy, Wayne. I do appreciate your comments about saying, hey, that's a worldly viewpoint, not God bringing reconciliation to uh, the people. Uh, but our, and our church struggles with it. I'll just, I'll just name it that way. Okay, uh, first Hilda, then John. Um, the, the section where it says he should not become despondent on that account. Yep, yep. God has forbidden both despair and presumption. Yep. Now, that's, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, that he says that, <clears> and <throat> that's what he does. However, someone who has sinned and perhaps it's a sin that society... Re- Deems repulsive or won't forget, God may forgive you, but society doesn't necessarily no. forgive you. That's right. And exactly. that can cause still a lot of despair for the individual who has sinned, but society will not forgive them. Actually, that is the exact same topic that um, I'm working with my deaconess intern on. Uh, it came up in my doxology retreat. Uh, I created a a little bit of a stir in class. We were using the term shame, okay? And what is your definition of shame? 
and I was operating with one definition of shame and someone else was operating with another. So let me give you the two definitions. Uh, shame in one essence could be any um, sin that you commit or has been committed against you, okay, that you're feeling uh, this uh, despondent or despair about. I was operating off the definition of shame being it is sins committed against you. Okay, and then I was saying the church needs to come up with better language for this, for the exact same point that uh, Hilda was bringing up. What do we do with people who have been abused by church leaders, for lack of a better way of describing this? And then the church leader says, hey, I'm forgiven th from Christ. I can be restored. And then what does the church do with somebody who has been sinned against and they're struggling with shame? How does restoration come to them? Okay, we understand confession absolution for the perpetrator, fair enough, but what does the victim get? Right now, not too much. Thank you. We are in the process of working on that. I'll just put it that way. Um, I don't think this will be the ultimate solution, uh, but at least it should provide an interesting framework that we can start working with through our church body to sit there and say, folks, we need to talk about this a little bit more because this is real. We have a segment of our population we're failing to reach because we know how to deal with Judah. There's forgiveness of sins, but now what about Tamar, for lack of a better way of describing it? Look at all the things that she went through what kind of healing does she need in the midst of this? Or are you going to just sit there and say to Tamar, well, now you're going to have children and now you're going to have uh, wealth, so you should be happy. No, there was some things that was sinned against her that she needs that healing for. And I'll be honest, in the church, we don't have a good answer for it. And we need to. So I'm raising that flag up to our church and saying, guys, we need to start talking about this and coming up with good solutions. So we're in the process of trying to put together a framework of uh, a service and then say to the church, you guys need to perfect it. You've got better talent out there than just uh, Pastor Bala and my deaconess intern. Yes, uh, Linda. That sounds very much like something Bev Yonke would do with a bunch of deaconesses yeah. at a conference because she's let us do other things that we were not able to do by ourselves. She was at the, the dining yeah. room table when I was discussing this so at my I think doxology that would be conference. So a wonderful yep. leader. Not that you shouldn't yeah. lead. I don't mean that. No, no, no. I'm just I'm just the pot stirrer. Right. I know my gift in life. I like to stir the pot. Uh, but I also know other people have a lot more gifts and abilities than I do. And so I know the pot needs to be handed off. Women uh, with women. Huh? Women with women. I, Yes. Most of the time. It, don't worry. It, it, it's going to get uh, moving because I'm not the one to perfect it. That much I can guarantee. I know my gifts and abilities, and that's not one of them. Again, I'm the pot stirrer. Yes, John. You know, we've separated the word secular here for forgiveness. I mean, we, we do not control the secular world with the word forgiveness because they don't understand what that means. Oh, I like where you're going with that. The world does have, uh, changes definitions on us. You're right. Yeah. And that there's, was actually um, something we were talking about at our general pastors conference, and uh, it's gonna be moving to our regional conferences, and we'll see whether it, where it goes from there. But we live in a world where they wanna constantly change definitions. And when you change definitions, you create the confusion. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what Satan wants to do. He yeah. is the confusion fusion chaos monster. But let me finish up the chapter. I got one slide. <laughs> That's going to take a long time because there's a lot going on here. Okay, so verse 27. When the time of labor came, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, one put out a hand and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand saying, this one came out first. But as he drew the back his hand, behold, his brother came out and she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore, his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with the scarlet thread on his hand and his name was called 
Zara. Okay, so uh, according to some, um, at this point, as soon as you see a hand, you know you're in trouble. The first thing you should be seeing is the head. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, but if we ignore that for a moment, uh, apparently the midwife uh, in her panic then quickly tied a scarlet head, a scarlet thread, and saying, this one came out first. Well, technically, did the, this one come out first? Mm -hmm. The hand came out, not the whole person. So now we have the big debate, who's first? Oh. Who's on first? Well, this reminds me oh. of the time I was having, we were having dinner and we were having pizza and uh, I chose, there was one piece left and I still had pizza on my plate. My brother still had pizza on his plate. I wanted that. <laughs> so I reached out my hand and I dumped hot pepper all over that pizza. I mean, I put a ton on that piece of pizza. My brother finished what was on his plate first. He picked that thing up and he started eating it. Who got the pizza? Brother. Who was first? Your brother. He ate it. There you go. <laughs> okay. Because it's not, it looked at, I read that and I'm like, well, I reached out my hand. It got tied, <coughs> right? I said, this is mine, sort of. But he got there first. So. But he that, ran to the bathroom after that. that that's why you don't no. put red pepper on it. You just lick your finger and then put your finger on it. <laughs> Okay, yeah, let's go back to this. To swear. <laughs> so in this map, I had Perez, or the map had Perez first and Zara second. In the other map, you had Zara first and Perez second. Uh, I'll give you the clue. Uh, if I can get back to this, thank you. Um, the line of Jesus is through Perez. Perez. Okay, uh, so we're looking at and believe me, it doesn't make a difference. God is going to choose the line because we've seen a few switches already and we're going to get one more interesting switch uh, at the end of the book of Genesis. But let's uh, close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.